Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at today. What are we talking about? Omega, and possibly the very first Omega Seamaster. Talking about the Dirty Dozen. Let's get to it. Another beautiful day in the neighborhood, another day on the job. So, talking about Omega Seamaster. I'd like to make a case that the very first Omega Seamaster was indeed the Dirty Dozen watch. We know the very first Omega Seamaster to bear the name Seamaster, 1948. But if you roll back and you look at when Omega first got into dive watches, you're looking at, I think it's 1930, 1932 with the Omega Marine, that you know rectangular uh, case where you get the the top comes out of it you have to slip it in there and I think you have to put it in there just to change the time or something I don't know I'm about to take a look at that but that was in the early 30s and so they started establishing themselves as a brand that made some serious dive watches and sure enough World War II comes around and uh, I don't know what's going on with these people here figure it out guys Gosh, drivers today, what are you gonna do with them? Uh, so, World War II comes along and the British MOD, Ministry of Defense, puts out a call for watches. And they're called the Dirty Dozen, there's a dozen producers. They're basically all the same watch uh, because they had to meet the government specs for service. <clears throat> and, uh, basically a field watch with some water resistancy for the time period some uh, yeah I mean these watches are 75 years old now so zero water resistancy at this point really neat piece really great watch from history uh, you know some of them were on the wrists of soldiers fighting the Nazis most were not uh, as I did some study into it, a lot of them delivered in 44, 45. Day late and a dollar short. But still really great, really cool watches. They wear a little on the small side. I'll put up the dimensions. And there's a dozen to choose from. Uh, the ones that are hardest to get, uh, hardest to find, IWC, uh, JLC, Longines, um... Grana, the Grana was, the Grana is the hardest to find because they made the fewest. They only made like 5,000 of those. They made plenty of these Omegas, but <laughs> some of the more expensive ones in the mid tier, the JLC is like eight grand. I can't justify that spend considering the watch probably would have cost 10 or 15 bucks to the soldier at the PX. but a neat watch nonetheless. So my case, uh, I wanna ignore the Marine watch because it's square, very different watch and purpose built for divers. The Seamaster comes along in 48 and they were purposely building on the specs and the design principles of their World War II watches. So, if nothing else, this Dirty Dozen watch is the inspiration for the Seamaster. Now, how did they make the Seamaster Master of the Sea? It changed out the gaskets. They were using some kind of wacky gaskets in this era, but they changed it out and ended up getting it to like 60 meters of water resistance, which is pretty amazing for the time. Uh, when the original Seamaster came out. But being that they were basing that design on this, I don't know, I'm calling it. Original Seamaster, Dirty Dozen. Of course, it doesn't have the name on it, so I guess I'm not right. But I feel right. It feels like it could be or should be. The OG Seamaster, Dirty Dozen. I love it. It's got those welded lugs 
which certainly it was a requirement by the MOD, limits your strap options. Uh, but you know, I've got this on a leather NATO and it looks amazing. It's, it's 18 millimeters lug width, but it, it looks really great on this brown leather NATO. I think this NATO is from Worn and Wound. I'll look it up and I'll, I'll put a link up because they did a really great job with this leather NATO and it's just gorgeous. You have to be careful when you go to buy one of these for a, a handful of reasons. There's a lot of ones that have been monkeyed with over the years. It's okay if the crystal's replaced. Also pretty much okay if the crown's redone. You have to be careful with what they've done to the dial. And these watches have radium on them. Muy muy no bueno. Um, you may have heard of the, the radium girls. Back in the day, they didn't know that radium was uh, poisonous to you. And so these, these poor, unfortunate women who were working in watchmakers, uh, watchmaker companies, they were painting the dials and exposure to that little jar of radium. And they would often take the brush and moisten it with their tongue, saliva, and terrible things. There's actually a documentary on it. You can check that out. Uh, so point being, radium is only, aged radium is only dangerous if it becomes powderized and uh, aerosol. So if you've got someone, if you're inclined to work on your watches, you do not want to work on these watches. You do not want to handle the deconstruct of the radium loom plops yourself. I mean, I'm sure there's someone in, you know, real watch. I like, I like to work on my watches, but you need to leave some stuff for the real watchmakers. This is one of them. You don't want to be scraping it off. It's going to get powerized. You breathe that in. Uh, not good. So point being, a lot of these watches have already had that done, which is good because, you know, who needs a bunch of radium? The challenge becomes if someone in the history since like 1950, 60s forward repainted the loom on there with, with Luminova or whatever was available at Tritium at the time, who knows? That's, I'm okay with them removing the radium, but putting in different loom, not too cool. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, redials, generally speaking, even though there are people who can do a really good job of it. The challenge becomes that there are a lot of people who don't. So you have to really be careful and really do your research because you can tell the redial versions or ones that have been redialed by looking at the holes in the eight and typically the curvature of the number two. Those two areas are the two areas worth noting. You know, you find a good reference point, a good reference model, and compare it to the one you might be hunting. So also don't forget, you know, movements get swapped over the years. So you're gonna wanna see you know, a picture of it with the case back removed. And one of the things I've noticed <clears throat> is that some people will, you know, a movement will go south, can't get parts for it, and then they'll end up swapping in a manually wound, manually wound movement from the period or from the manufacturer even. So you have to pay attention to that. And also the metal retaining ring that keeps the movement in there stable. I've seen a lot of uh, watches listed with where well, that's completely gone. Not the end of the world, but when you consider what some of these are going for, you, you got to do your, you got to do your research, got to do your homework like anything else. And they're shooting up in value. I think I once did the math. If you tried to buy all 12 of them, be north of 40 grand way too much way too much 
but thankfully there are a number of brands, producers, who are releasing modern versions. Longines, for instance. They've got a great one. Vertex is another one. I love my Vertex. Vertex is a very unusual brand. Uh, I That's the Dirty Dozen reference I bought first. because I, I thought it was a cool name. And at the time, you could get them for a lot cheaper than the Omegas. Uh, so I picked up one of those. And I ended up picking up one of the modern reissues by Vertex. The uh, I think the grand the great grandson, I believe. I believe is uh, the one who reinvigorated that brand, Vertex. So I'm going to do a separate video on the Vertex ones, maybe like a double trouble side by side. That's pretty cool. And then there's one other. I think it's either the Record Dirty Dozen or it's the Timor. Dirty Dozen. I ought to have looked that up. But it's another one of the lesser known ones that did a an, an additional reissue. I'll have to look that up and insert it. Note to the editorial staff. <laughs> Otherwise known as a note to self. D. Find a picture of that one and insert it here. A lot of fun. 70, oh, it was on 54, 75 years. This watch is 75 years old. And it still runs great. It's about a minute slow on a day, over the course of a day. But if you're 75 and you're only a, a minute late, I'm good with that. Go on, sir. Take that extra minute. A lot of fun. Uh, I noticed that some people, uh, have also cut out the lugs, the welded lugs, in favor of putting in uh, spring bar holes. No, thank you. Watch out for those. Watch out for them all. Be very, very careful. Like always, by the seller. But even some sellers, well intentioned, who perhaps don't know enough about these watches. You end up passing on a watch that's less than original. Do your research. This is one of my Omega books, and this one is from Japan. It's mostly in uh, Japanese kanji, but also some in English. But I buy books uh, from other countries, not in English, uh, because mostly what I'm after are photos and reference numbers. And this is a book we'll get into in a little greater detail in a future episode as we look to expound upon the notion that books, a watch library, watch book library is good for you. So uh, we have a lot of different Seamaster models and references in here. But the reason I'm dropping this in at this point in this video is, ba-bam, the Omega Dirty Dozen watch even that very familiar photo of these two gentlemen in a book about the Omega Seamaster. I hereby rest my case. The Dirty Dozen Watch is indeed part of the Omega Seamaster history.